and we'll just uh, wait a wait a moment. We may because the numbers are the numbers are coming rising quite rapidly. Okay. Right. Well, welcome everybody. Um, let me just. Um, I think we've got. Um, yeah, I think that's. Uh, we're ready to start. Welcome everybody uh, to King's uh, Maritime History Seminar. Thank you uh, for joining us tonight. Um, I thank you on behalf of the British Commission for Maritime History, of course, who organize um, these, these seminars. And um, I'm thanking you on behalf of the Lawton Naval uh, Unit here in the Department of War Studies, uh, King's College uh, London, your, your hosts for, for tonight and, uh, and always. Um, for these uh, for these sessions, I always like to mention the Society for Nautical Research, uh, who have always uh, supported this seminar series. We're very grateful to them uh, and uh, to to Lloyd's uh, Register, uh, of course. Uh, tonight, it's a great pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Eric Grove. He's a graduate of King's. Uh, he's taught uh, all over the place in 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 Dartmouth. He's taught. Um, in Annapolis, the, the, the Naval Academy uh, there, the uh, Joint Services Staff College uh, in Shrivenham. He's taught at Greenwich. He's taught at uh, a university in uh, Cambridge. Um, they have one, uh, Hull, <laughs> Salford, Liverpool, Hope, um, all over the place. But he's known, uh, of course, uh, for his prodigious output. Uh, for his uh, energy, for his enthusiasm, uh, for and his contribution to naval and maritime history. Uh, we all know this. Um, uh, from uh, Vanguard to Trident is probably his, his best known book, possibly. It's a standard on uh, post-45 uh, British naval policy, but it's not just that period. It's the past he's written about. Uh, I know the Royal Navy from since 1815. He writes about the future. The uh, Future of Sea Power. He's written all sorts of uh, other books uh, and articles, of course, and tonight he's taking us back uh, to World War I, uh, to the oft discussed, but as I suspect we're about to find out, poorly understood issue of the British blockade of Germany uh, in World War I. I'm going to remind everybody, if they would, uh, to type their questions into uh, a, the Q&A uh, box that you see rather than the chat. You can use the chat to send uh, panic messages to me if I'm uh, messing things up, uh, but questions uh, into the Q&A, uh, please. Otherwise, uh, again, it's an honor to have you here, uh, Eric, uh, and so it's with great pleasure uh, that I hand over to you. It's an honour to be here and greetings from what has been a relatively sunny Blackpool today. Um, I, was in, I was encouraged to study this subject because I began to come across sources saying that actually the much vaunted blockade of Germany in the First World War had not been quite so effective as many people say. Yes, it was certainly effective by the end of the war. But for most of the war, there were great problems with it. And in fact, the Royal Navy itself got extremely annoyed that ships it was taking. And in fact, the effort was quite considerable. The 10th Cruiser Squadron between March um, 1915 and uh, the end of June, uh, sorry, the end of the year 1916, uh, was intercepting 286 ships a month. That's almost 10 ships a day. And they were sending them into Kirkwall. But the problem was that very few of them had their cargoes put before the prize court, something that the Foreign Office had set up, the contraband committee would intervene and usually allow the ships to be released. The most egregious example of this in 1915 was the American owned standard oil tanker Lama that was carrying oil bound for Germany, was taken into Kirkwall and the contraband committee, I, I presume to keep, and we, you can talk about the reasons for this later, to keep friendly with the United States, decided it, it would be released. So it sailed to Germany and, and its cargo was, was put ashore in Gotenhafen. Then it was allowed out again, tried to do it again, and interestingly enough, on its way into Kirkwall, hit a, hit a sandbank and sank. I wonder if the pilot was getting a little bit tired of all these things going on. 
Um, and in fact, if you look at some of the sources on the blockade, for example, Keeble Chatterton's famous book written in the early 30s, where he says that, um, that, uh, that cargoes obviously intended for Germany were allowed to continue to, to their destination, whereas the blockaders had no source of had no sort of doubt, and the prize courts would certainly have condemned such, such cargoes. Writing in 1932, he says, we know all too well how this misguided rule of allowing supplies to reach the enemy had the effect of prolonging the war. And even at the time, actually, one or two critical MPs, ignoring pressure not to talk about this, said things like this on the 27th of March, 1917, Sir Henry D.L. said, for the first 18 months of the war, the Admiralty were in a state of despair with regard to the actions of the Foreign Office. They were bringing in day after day ships which were admittedly carrying cargo to the benefit of the enemy. What happened? A telegram was sent, uh, was sent to London to the Foreign Office and in reply, often in the course of a few hours, a telegram came informing them that they ought to let the ships go through, which tended to make our sailors absolutely depressed and in despair. The whole thing was treated as a farce though ship after ship, to the knowledge of the officers, carried goods to Germany. And that is borne out by the figures. My main source for tonight's talk is a fascinating book that needs to be better, uh, um, uh, better known. It's the memoirs of Admiral Consett, C-O-N-S-E-T-T, -T, who was our, our attaché to the three Scandinavian capitals, Christiania, as Oslo was, was called then, uh, Copenhagen and Stockholm. And he wrote this book, which actually tells you all you, all you need to know on the cover. An account of the, tr the triumph of unarmed forces, which of course is what he says happened later, an account of the transactions by which Germany during the Great War was able to obtain supplies prior to the collapse, prior to her collapse under the pressure of economic sources, for, sorry, economic forces. And the story he tells is in some respects rather a shocking one, that in fact, if you look at vital strategic materials, the British just did not choose for quite some time to use the power they had to bring pressure to bear upon the neutrals to stop trading with the enemy. In fact, Moltke's uh, instinct not to conquer Holland and also the Germans allowing Sweden and Denmark and Norway to some extent to, um, uh, to remain neutral allowed them a tremendous hole in the whole blockade. But in fact, stuff began to came in in increased quantities, and we'll see how much increased uh, in a moment, uh, in order to pass into Germany. And in fact, coal, for example. Now, the British dominated the coal market, not just with Welsh steam coal, but also with other types of coal vital for other parts of industry. Now, Sweden, in September 1914, the month after Britain entered the war, got equivalent to a seventh of its yearly requirement. 633,000 tonnes of British coal. And in fact, coal, the coal trade with Sweden continued as if in peacetime. And in fact, Scandinavian ships provided Germany with goods using British bunkers. It's quite remarkable. Um, Nor uh, Norwegian ship owners, even though the Norwegians on the whole were rather more pro-British than the Swedes or the Danes were, said that it was as, said that they were having a splendid game making huge profits because, of course, the Germans, under a certain amount of blockade pressure, were paying what the Americans would say top dollar for their supplies. And the Germans said, OK, well, if you don't, if the British won't supply with coal, we will. But the problem was that German coal was useless for any kind of steaming and it had to be mixed with British coal. And so it was vital that British coal was actually imported. In fact, coal, British coal was used on the trains and in the ships to bring Swedish iron ore, despite the efforts of British submarines at the time, across the Baltic. And it wasn't until early 1918, actually, that attempts were made to use coal to limit iron ore exports. And these were, in fact, in the end, unsuccessful. Denmark controlled its coal trade by something called a coal, a, a coal bureau, but it was entirely under Danish control. And as Consit said, was rather too popular. Um, large amounts of British coal were received by Denmark, 3 million tonnes a year in 1915. It, it was reduced somewhat to 2.3 million in 1916. But nonetheless, this did not mean that the Danes continued to provide Britain with large amounts of food. 
In fact, the amount of exports to Germany and Austria of German food um, transported with British coal uh, in, uh, in trains, etc., increased in 1916 to 314 million tonnes. But it was still, it was still, it was, uh, 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 sorry, 314,000 tonnes, and it was still 200,000 tonnes in 1917. In fact, all over Scandinavia, there were German railway trucks being traveling in trains powered by engines which were provided with British coal. And in fact, as Consit puts it, British miners were effectively working for the Germans. The total amount of coal exported to the end of 1917 was 21.6 million tonnes, which did a lot to help the German war effort. Now, I've mentioned already Danish agricultural produce. The last six months of 1914, some 68,000 uh, 68, horses, well, sorry, 68,000 more horses were sent to Germany than pre-war in the last six months of 1914. Attempts to try to ration the Danes to an amount which uh, was a was equivalent to their own supplies failed. In fact, the whole rationing system was a bit of a farce actually. And this very much helped Germany survive in food terms in 1916 and 1917. Denmark acted to some extent as a kind of German satellite. In fact, the East Asiatic Steamship Company, interestingly enough, didn't lose a single ship in the First World War to the U-boats. They were too useful to helping bringing in supplies to help keep, keep 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 Germany going. Uh, in, in the, um, at one point, uh, the Danes uh, provided enough meat rations a day for the, virtually the entire German army. And the Danes himself, and the Danes themselves actually suffered quite considerably. They were rather neglected because why sell stuff at peacetime prices or at least at lower prices to your own nationals when the Germans will pay you? Um, foodstuffs from Denmark, ex exports to Germany increased from about 125,000 tonnes uh, at the beginning of the war to more than twice, to 300,000 tonnes. And in fact, exports from the UK, uh, or, the, or perhaps the whole empire, were 100,000 tonnes of that. So in fact, British exports were helping keep Denmark going so the Danes could provide material for the Germans in significant quantities. Now, certain attempts were, were made to make certain materials uh, uh, hard to get. In fact, copper was made contraband uh, on the 20th of October, 1914, but it's continued to be exported to Sweden. In fact, exports to Sweden went up to 1,085 tonnes in 1915, and British ships were used to bring this copper to Sweden. Norway's exports to Germany, as I say, the Norwegians on the whole were more pro-British than the other Scandinavians, but Norway's exports to Germany increased from, from 406 tonnes to 1,229 tonnes in 1916, and they'd gone through 1,573 tonnes in 1915. So copper, vital for many aspects of, of the war effort and weapons production, was getting through. And this was because these Scandinavian countries were able to use material they got from Britain in order to produce this stuff uh, and transport it particularly. Uh, nickel, important for the, for the production of things like armor plate, uh, was, uh, was, was exported at twice, at twice the war level. And in fact, in 1915, over 500 tons of nickel were actually exported to, um, into Sweden, of which 70 tons went straight to Germany and the rest was used to, to uh, provide a material or material for Germany. Fish. Now fish may not sound very, very uh, dramatic, but in fact, um, fish was the main item in the German diet uh, in, in the first two years after the war began. And of course, fish oil was very important for the production of glycerin in the explosives um, industry. Attempts were made by the people on the spot to try to get the treasury to purchase all Norwegian fish, but the treasury wasn't interested. It wouldn't spend the money. And in fact, eventually, the, 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 after a year or two, there was an agreement, but at three times the price, much to concert's disgust. Exports of fish 
to Germany and Austria from Norway increased from 68,000 tons in 1914 to 194,000 tons in 1916. Came down a bit in 1917, but nonetheless, you can see the huge increase. And this, of course, helped keep fish on the tables, which one gathers were important uh, in Germany uh, in 1915 and 1916. Denmark uh, increased its uh, exports of fish to Germany from about from about from about twenty five and a half thousand in nineteen thirteen to one hundred and seven thousand in nineteen sixty. Again, you see this huge great increase. Um, now, what makes this these fishing exports so? In fact, uh, actually, total Scandinavian exports. Oh, no, just to make the point again, 130,000 tons in 1913, 350,000 tons in 1960. So a huge, great increase. And what made this particularly annoying as far as the attaché was concerned was that the fishing gear which, which caught the fish was supplied by the British. The fuel which fueled the trawlers, be they coal burning or petrol burning or petroleum burning, was supplied via the British. And in fact, it wasn't until the end of 1916 that flows of petroleum were in fact stopped. Explosives, quite an important point in the war. Now, oils and fats come in here. It, mean, it's, it seems a bit mundane, but actually oils and fats are important because this produces glycerin. Um, Denmark was provided with vegetable oil, fats and oil cake from the British Empire, far in excess from peacetime quantities. Um, and in fact, there was a, over a, over a 20,000 increase in oil values um, in, the, um, in the early years of the war. Cattle, cattle exports were increased in 1913, something like 152,000, would you believe? By 1916, 305,000, each carrying not just meat, but nicely fattened up on uh, oil cake that the British had supplied uh, so they could provide the, uh, the Germans uh, with, um, with, uh, with um, a material. Increased imports of soya beans. Now, soya beans might not seem to be a great strategic asset, but actually they are. And copra too. Copra had to come from Manchuria. This is a, uh, you know, made from coconuts. Um, and huge amounts increased. In fact, once the, um, once attempts were made to try to limit imports of this, um, there was a um, there were attempts made to actually um, provide other ways of making fertilizer, which Rio Tinto included. But anyway, but I'll, I'm getting ahead of myself, really. Um, in two years, imports of British copra um, were, in fact, um, um, providing twenty thousand tons of grease and seventy thousand tons of of fattening were actually imported uh, into Denmark. And, and Germany was dependent on imports completely for its glycerine. Um, vegetable oil, huge great increases too. And the British were providing vegetable oil. It wasn't just being produced um, from uh, other imports. Lubricants, well, I mentioned oil coming from the USA to, to Germany in the affair of the tanker. Danish imports of lubricating oil increased. In 1913, 5,500 tons. In 1916, 11,000 tons. Cotton was a particular factor. We, we may think of cotton just in terms of textiles, but actually cotton was a vitally important part of explosives production. In the first five months of 1915, Sweden imported 3.4 million 100 pound bales of cotton from the United States. Swedish imports in 1913, 25,000 tons of cotton. 1915, 123,000 tons of cotton. And from the British Empire itself, an increase from almost 2,000 to 19,300 tons of cotton. I'm sure the German armaments industry was very grateful. So we have these, these, these even though cotton was actually declared contraband at the end of 1915, the British were still supplying the Scandinavian countries with 18,500 18 tons of it in 1916 and 7,500 tons of it in 1917. Holland was producing 100,000 tons more cotton, uh, was importing 100,000 tons more cotton in, 19, in 1915 than in 1913. And even after cotton itself was being limited, um, 
cotton materials, peace goods, were actually being imported. In 1916, 46 million yards of cotton fabric were imported. That was 16 yards per head of the Danish population. I'm sure the Danish population got nowhere near uh, where that, that cotton was going. Sweden, um, it, 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 um, Sweden had its, its exports eventually, eventually cut, but actually sulfite pulp, it's interesting what, you know, what becomes a, a, a interested in if you're dealing with this kind of blockade stuff. This was great, exports of that as a substitute for cotton was, were in fact tripled um, to, to uh, Germany. And what makes this in interesting is that all this sulfite pulp, which was exports, as I say, were tripled, was produced with British coal. Binder twine doesn't seem very interesting, but actually it was important to make um, uh, the um, harvesting um, work. And in fact, um, huge amounts were actually exported from the British Empire to the, uh, to the Danes and other Scandinavian countries. Fertilizers. Um, Although uh, a certain amount of cutoff was achieved by 1916, um, phosphate rock was it, it exported by the French from North Africa, and Rio Tinto, with its headquarters in London, very kindly provided the pyrites, which were, allowed it to be used as fertilizer. The how was this financed? Obviously, Germany's exports weren't. You know, were to some extent a shadow of their former self, but they got a lot of loan. Well, they issued a lot of bonds. And in fact, attempts to try to limit that financing were not very successful. And it may not be a coincidence that there were important financial links between British and Scandinavian banks. Quite often, Scandinavian bankers would, would, uh, would come to London to make sure that everything was still okay. Just to finish off the figures, total Scandinavian exports of foodstuffs to Germany. In 1913, it had been, it, it had been 250,000 tonnes. By 1916, it was 600,000 tonnes plus. No wonder Consett got slightly annoyed at all this. But attempts to try to get the British to find out what was going on fell on stony ground. One of the most notable um, uh, uh, events in here was when Lord Farringdon, as he soon became, as a reward, I think, went over to Scandinavia and came back to Parliament and said, don't worry, there's very little getting through from Scandinavia to Germany. A complete falsehood. Now, why was this allowed to happen? One can speculate, one can come up with wonderful extreme conspiracy theories that this was trying to make the war last longer. I don't think you have to come up with uh, elaborate conspiracy theories. As I've said before, I, I'm a great believer in the cock up theory of history, but it does seem to me that there were a number of reasons why the blockade was allowed to continue in this useless way that it did until the Lloyd George government in 1917 and other, and particularly the American entry into the war. And perhaps this is, what, this is the first thing we should talk about, American entry into the war. The United States acted as the great protector of the neutrals. The Americans weren't very happy with the British, not just because we were stopping their ships. They wouldn't have minded, they said, if we'd actually put them before a a, a prize court. What they didn't like was the rather arbitrary way the contraband committee sometimes released and sometimes didn't American ships. Also, the Americans were very annoyed that British ships were trading in the materials the British were trying to stop the Americans delivering to the Scandinavians. One can't blame them, really. Um, it is said by the those who say that we should have been tighter with the United States, that in fact, the Americans had so much interest in the Allied cause, particularly economic interest in supplying the British and the French, that they would never in fact have taken serious action against us. I'm not so sure. I think by the end of 1916, the Americans thought the Allies were not winning the war. The Federal Reserve was saying, don't lend any more money to the British. Uh, but of course the Germans shoot themselves in the foot. Um, in, in, in 1917 by introducing unrestricted submarine, submarine warfare. The Americans come in and then, interestingly enough, the Americans start saying to the British, stop supplying the neutrals. As Consett says, one must almost have thought 
looking at the documents that in fact, looking, looking at, the, at, the, at the correspondence, that in fact the Americans were trying to force the British into carrying out a proper blockade. Poacher turned gamekeeper indeed. So, there were the Swedes too. Now, we, the, the British were very concerned if alienating the Americans was something, and of course, Edward Gray said that the, his great achievement as foreign secretary was in fact to keep the Americans on side. Now, one can argue, we can, we can talk about it later perhaps, you know, would the, was it a great, a great problem keeping the Americans on side? But if that meant allowing their tankers through to Germany, okay, so be it. Um, Sweden was interesting because uh, Sweden was relatively pro-German, at least the Swedish government was. And Sweden was important for contacts with the Russians. At that time, of course, particularly after the Dardanelles had been closed and Vladivostok was rather a long way around, and also there wasn't a railway to Murmansk until the middle of the war, um, they had to use reindeer apparently and sledges uh, to Archangel when, when, uh, when Archangel uh, uh, um, iced up. Um, supplying Russia was quite important. And this had to be done across Sweden. And the Swedes kept on saying, yes, you know, it's very important that you supply us with stuff uh, so that we will continue to help supply the Russians. Sadly, a lot of the stuff that went via Sweden to the Russians never got there. There were stories of uh, motorboats coming over from Finland, from Germany, with stuff that had been sent to the Swedes for the Russians and being delivered to the Germans. This was another great hole in the blockade. But one can see, I suppose, a certain strategic reason for, for trying to keep on the right side of the Swedes. As far as the Danes were concerned, the Danes said, look, um, if, if, we don't, if we don't supply the Germans with this stuff, if you won't give us the material to supply the Germans with this stuff, the Germans will occupy us. To which Consett said, what a good idea. It'll mean that, we'll, that we can blockade you properly. And there's something in that, I think. The amount of material that was sent, I think, as Consett did, made all the difference between the British blockade being effective, truly effective, against Germany in 1916 and 1970. Yes, there were hardships in Germany, but this huge, great rent in the blockade, that all this food, all this other material getting through to Germany, uh, supply, transported by British coal in ships and trains, um, from factories supplied with British coal, with fish supplied from with British coal and petroleum and nets and this kind of thing. All this helped mitigate the effects of the blockade. The blockade did not in fact have decisive effect in, 19, in 1916 and even into 1970, despite the ministry of the blockade, despite all these orders in council, despite all these things that look good on paper and which have been repeated in books, it didn't happen because merchants, ship owners, bankers were allowed effectively, as Consit puts it, to trade with the enemy for their own economic advantage and perceived by the Foreign Office diplomatic advantage also. Consit puts it quite well towards the end of his book. He says, the policy of trading, which was justified on the twofold ground of the benefit to the exchange and our obligations to neutrals, which had been justified that way, would not seem to have been fairly balanced against the succour that it brought to our enemies. This country was rich and could afford to make sacrifices. Yet when the war had been in progress for nearly three years and our finances were becoming unstable, trade was stopped and the question of the improvement of the exchange was put to one side. As to our obligations to neutrals, there were also obligations to ourselves to be considered. Neutrals were protected by international law. No Scandinavian neutral has successfully challenged the legality or I think even the propriety of any belligerent action of ours once we started getting serious. And I'll end up with perhaps a call, as one should on these occasions, with a call in a sense for further research. Um, Although we had a resourceful and determined foe to contend with and could not have it all our own way during the economic struggle in which we were engaged, and although in the outconduct of the blockade there were certain features which, as the title of this book seeks to indicate, it would serve no useful purpose now to recall. Yet the failure to prevent supplies from reaching our enemies on a less immoderate scale than the recorded stands, I think, in need of fuller explanation than has yet been given. And I'm not sure the explanation has been given yet. Thank you very much. Great.
Thank you very much. That uh, was uh, sparkling uh, <laughs> and uh, controversial, uh, I'm, I'm sure. Uh, I'm going to kick off uh, by uh, sharing a drink with you. Uh, yes. Congratulations. Uh, here's to Admiral, here's to Admiral Consett. Indeed, indeed. He died in 1945, by the way. Okay, I was going to ask that. Uh, um, I'm going to award a prize for the best background, mind you. Uh, <laughs> uh, that 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 prize goes goes to you for sure, uh, and a prize for speaking without PowerPoint. I'm always impressed. Uh, you need to be an engaging speaker to be able to get away with uh, that, um, and uh, we should all be uh, able to do that. And you certainly uh, are. So many thanks. Uh, for, Pleasure. Um, yeah, as an early modernist, I'm surprised to hear about copper going to Sweden. Uh, it's like Coles to Newcastle, uh, to, you know, from the 17th century, but uh, there you are. That was only one of the uh, many, uh, many surprises. They uh, used it to electrify the line from Kiruna to the Norwegian border. Uh, and one of the things which is interesting is I've yet to see figures for anything that comes through Narvik. Mm. Because presumably the weather doesn't change, and in winter they would have had to have sent the sent the iron ore through Narvik. Mm, mm. But it's interesting that they use what copper they had to electrify the line halfway mm, mm, up to mm. the Swedish border. Mm. Okay, uh, we've got some questions uh, piling in. Um, this is so unbelievable that you know I'm tempted to ask if this concept chap was some kind of crank, uh, but I'm sure he's not. Uh, so I won't. Uh, there's a comment from uh, Professor Hugh Murphy here. Uh, uh -huh. Yes. Uh, about, a good friend. Indeed. Uh, the Sch Sch Schleswig-Holstein question. Denmark aiding Germany had obviously forgotten all about that, uh, which uh, Palmerston, as we know, memorably recalled that only three people really understood. I have an immediate answer to that. Go for it. The Danes didn't like us for not sticking up for them. Uh. And also, they remembered Copenhagen, a particularly second Copenhagen. Right. Okay. So we weren't that popular in Denmark. Uh -huh. And Schleswig-Holstein had actually worked against us as well as the Germans. The Danes felt somewhat isolated from both okay. sides. Excellent. OK, good. All right. Uh, Alex Pickering got the first question in. Uh, he, he was asking about, about the money. And I, 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 think, I think you sort of answered it because the, the question was, was the money necessary? Uh, the money that was being made? Was it necessary to keep businesses going uh, and, and to pay for the war? So I suppose, I, I, actually, that, that I didn't quite fully understand the question at first, but, you know, was the money important? Uh, well, it's a good point, actually. I, yes. mean, I mean, there was no point Britain's, Britain fighting the war and losing all, all her markets and mm. so on. And mm. so one can see the Board of Trade and the Foreign Office were in cahoots on this, and one can quite see why. Mm. But in fact, you know, you didn't want to lose your trade. You wanted to make profits. You needed to make profits. And this meant maintaining as much seaborne trade as you possibly could. And, if, and, and perhaps in retrospect, trading with the enemy, unquote, looks worse in retrospect than it did in prospect or actually when it happened. Because mm. pe in people's minds, militaries did war. Traders and merchant shipping did peace. Mm. And the two were in different parts of people's minds. And I think there was a cultural thing here. <laughs> Very good. OK, uh, let's move on here. Uh, Ian Stafford, uh, did the U-boat commanders uh, have the info to be discerning? Yeah. Also, was it the fault of Asquith? The U-boat commanders were discerning, particularly in the period of restricted warfare, although even in unrestricted warfare, there's an interesting case where one submarine sinks a Norwegian ship that's carrying things uh, for, uh, for, uh, for Britain, sinks a second ship and then allows another ship carrying corn, carrying, uh, corn cake, uh, cattle food to Denmark mm. to go on, saying, good, you're on our side. <laughs> Um, and so they could be, and in fact, as I said, of this shipping line, this this I think this Danish use, not a single ship was sunk. Not a single ship. Hmm. That tells you something, doesn't it? Okay, uh, Tom Golding, thanks for your interesting and enlightening talk. Uh, do we have any idea how much the shortfall in supplies was made up through the trade through neutrals? Is the question. Well, I think I think oh, what I would say is this, and I tried to say this briefly in my talk. If the trade through the neutrals had been stopped early on, hmm. 
there is at least, and I think more analysis perhaps needs, needs to be done, but if it had been stopped earlier on, I think there is a very, in fact, immediately, which the Scandinavians mm. expected, interestingly mm. enough. They tried to stockpile as much as they could, even better than the Germans in some ways, because they expected to be cut off completely. They were surprised that, that they weren't. In fact, British prestige suffered that they weren't cut off mm. because they expected to be. But the key point is this, and to answer the question, I think that the stuff that came in, the masses of stuff that came in, particularly food and particularly materials for explosives, allowed Germany to continue the war in a way that she would not have been able to if these supplies had not leaked in. Mm -hmm. In fact, not leaked in, cascaded in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you've made that point. Okay, Neil Dodson has a comment rather than a question, although I think there's a question behind it. Uh, it should be borne in mind that there was a strong lobby in Britain that actually believed in the immunity of trade. So I believe it was Lord Lorburn, and, who, who in 1916 told the House of Lords that we are not at war with the German people, uh, but the German government, and that we should not regulate trade uh, at all. Well, that was certainly a factor, although yeah. it would have helped if Churchill hadn't, as first, first Lord, hadn't, hadn't made speeches like saying, oh, the blockade is very effective and it will grind the Germans down. Mm, mm, mm. So, see the, so yes, that there were, but I think a basic factor behind this rather strange policy towards the blockade in Germany was very much as, as had just been said that mm. in fact you know did we did you make war on the German people? Uh, did you in fact affect your economic interests as we said earlier? And the mm. answer was perhaps no. Mm -hmm. And in fact, the contraband committee reflected that in in its in its um, decisions. But it must have been very, very annoying. And I know it was, in fact, at points Jellico complained, in fact, that he had the 10th Cruiser Squadron people risking their lives in the Atlantic, stopping 10 ships a day uh, in very difficult conditions. The stuff comes to Kirkwall and then it sends, it's sent onwards. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, how about Andy Field then? What caused the Germans to start going after the Norwegian convoys in 1917-18? Um, they were... By that time, I think they were they were trying to. Inter I think at one, I think up to a point, they were trying to interfere with the supplies that we were getting from Norway uh, uh, towards um, towards um, towards Britain. Um, and uh, there's also a slightly unjoined up thing in German policy. The German Navy attacks things which are sometimes operating in their own interest. As Curver has been pointing out recently in his very good book, The Kaiser's you know, U-Boat War Against America, the German Navy was to some extent out of control. At times, the German Navy did something that wouldn't necessarily make sense in terms of their overall policy. I mean, there were times when ships were saved and not attacked because they were actually operating in Germany's interest. But there were times when, in fact, um, uh, you know, the... the, the um, uh, the, the German Navy was actually doing things, not least introducing unrestricted submarine warfare that was ver was very much against Germany's interest, both in 1915 and 19 and 19 uh, and 1917. I would have to look actually. Did did they attack only outward bound convoys or inward bound convoys? I'm not quite sure. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, well we'll leave that one. Uh, Alex Pickering again. I'll have to do some work on that. That's very that's a very interesting point, Andy. In regards from me, old friend of mine. Good. Fantastic. What role did Parliament play, asks uh, Alex Pickering, uh, concerning the blockade? So the Parliament. Uh, were there any select committees? Uh, do you think a unified government undermined proper scrutiny? Um, one gets the impression that, in fact, at times, and I quoted DL, there were, in fact, uh, uh, some hostile parliamentary comments about the blockade. Mm -hmm. But the but the usual result was there's nothing to worry about. Everything's going well uh, and so on. And also, I get the impression that some pressure was brought to bear against critics not to uh, speak out too much. OK. Uh, and, 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 and this was very much allowed to go on. Now, as time goes by, of course, the blockade becomes more and more effective. In fact, as Consit says, it's surprising that all those factors which were held until 1916, 17 to actually stop us doing more were actually forgotten about hmm. because we were, we were trying to use the blockade in a much more, in a much more uh, intensive form, particularly once the Americans were around. In fact, the Americans are the key here. America became the greatest factor behind the blockade. By the end of 1917, we don't have to have ships in the Atlantic. The 10th Cruiser Squadron is disbanded. Mm 
we have a good intelligence system, as Andy Boyd has pointed out in the United States. We, you know, we have a whole system whereby trade is being interdicted without the need to actually stop ships. We're actually reducing the imports of the neutrals quite considerably. And I suppose this could be a, a, quite a significant factor. America was the great champion of the neutrals. And once America becomes an associated power, that all changes. It all changes. It changes the whole political and economic situation. Okay. Okay. Very good. Um, okay. Uh, given, uh, asks David Potter, um, given that one of the main aims of Fisher's Baltic plan was to expand the blockade to include the Baltic ports, what effect do you think this plan would have had if it were successful in the face of the material being supplied by neutral parties to Germany? It could have been very important indeed. And in mm -hmm. fact, in fact, one of the you know, one of the reasons, what, what, well, I think one of the arguments Consit makes is that actually it's a great pity that in fact the Swedes didn't enter the war and Denmark hadn't been invaded because we could have allowed to operate the fleet much closer to the Scandinavian areas, perhaps even got a base on the coast of Sweden. And then we could have really interdicted the supplies of, ma of, of magnetic ore from, from Lulea down into Germany. There's one case actually which which sort of typifies, you know, the, the, the strangest of the blockade. I didn't mention it. Apparently a ship was stopped and brought in, I think, to a Russian port, uh, but it was allowed to leave because magnetic ore wasn't on the list. Hmm. Ordinary iron ore was, but magnetic ore wasn't. <laughs> I mean, these sort of extraordinary things happening. And I saw somebody say, yes, large numbers of Danish ships were sunk. Yes, they were, but significant numbers of Danish ships weren't. Now we did manage to mobilize Danish ships on the, in support of the allies. And the Danes couldn't do much about it. And yes, the Danes did suffer losses, but the Danish farmers made huge profits. Mm. Okay, very good. Uh, Craig uh, Kerner, uh, Nicholas Lambert in Planning Armageddon argues that the British expected to stop German trade by denying them finance, not necessarily by naval blockade. At least that's how, what he recalls from many years ago. Was there any relationship or interaction between the counter-finance campaign and the counter-ship campaigns against Germany? Um, as far as Nick's thesis is concerned, I think I tend to agree actually with Andy Boyd's critique of it, that in fact it wasn't a, a, an agreed overall British policy, and that in fact all the factors I mentioned which mitigated against the blockade were actually considered at the time and said no we can't do this. We, you know, we can't engage in this kind of huge, great economic disruption. This is going to affect us as bad as anybody. Mm. Um, and as far as finance is concerned, uh, my view is that um, there were lots of people in Britain, in the financial world, and in America in the financial world, and so on, who saw advantages in the situation I've described. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm. Okay. Brendan uh, O'Farrell. Uh, what legal steps had to be taken before imposing the blockade? Well, the legal situation was actually in the air because, of course, we'd uh, we'd, we'd been we'd we got together the infamous Declaration of London of 1909, and in fact, declaring um, we had to declare various things contraband, uh, both in terms of uh, of the Declaration of London, which we eventually abandoned, and also things we declared as contraband because of retaliation for the U-boat campaign and so on. So yes, there was, there was a certain amount of, in fact, a considerable amount of legal activity. The problem was not much got to the, got to the prize courts. Thank you, the Contraband Committee, mm. because the whole blockade was politicized via the Contraband Committee. So although it looks on paper as if we have a very strong legal position and strong legal measures, in fact, the Contraband Committee makes sure that they're not effective. Mm -hmm. Contraband Committee needs a lot more, a lot more examination. Right, yes, I suspect there's a lot more work to be done. Uh... Well, it's been, it's been ignored because we've had this sort of comfortable sort of uh, uh, assumption that the blockade was working right from the start. I mean, for example, you know, we had argued in, in, in 2016 that the Battle of Jutland occurred because the blockade was so bad the Germans were trying to break out of it. Uh, sorry, that just isn't true. Um, it's only in 1917, even though there is turnip winter, etc. in 1916-17. Nonetheless, Western allied economic pressure could have been, I think, much more decisive if this cascade of stuff from the neutrals had been stopped. Mm 
Well, here's a follow on question then, because George Wilton is saying this, the blockade is often seen as material in the defeat of Germany. So would a tighter blockade from day one have brought the war to an end much earlier, if at all? In my opinion, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Which, which makes these failures all the more egregious, I suppose. Yes, it does. Yes, yes, it does. Okay. Uh, David Richardson, uh, moving right along. Um, Gray was challenged in the Commons on Farringdon's report and said he wasn't prepared to answer detailed questions and had confidence in Farringdon. Does this suggest that Asquith's government was overly trusting of Farringdon or that it was complicit in the scandal? I think possibly complicit. Mm -hmm. I think Farringdon had been briefed by Consit. He knew what was going on and he deliberately uh, and and he he knew which side his bread was buttered and where his peerage was coming from. Mm -hmm. I know this may sound cheap, but on the other hand, I, th I think there is a factor in this. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the, there is a there is a that that the, the, the there is, it seems to me, the more I've gone into this, a whiff of scandal about all this. Mm. OK, OK. I mean, when you consider that this is at a time when the poor old forces on the Western Front are dying in large numbers. Sure, sure. Mm. In fact, in fact, in, 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 in fact, there was one chap, actually, did I, did I find it? Um, yeah, there was one, a very strong critic, actually, in, in um, in Parliament, who actually had been an army officer, who said it was utterly disgusting that all this had been going on and the soldiers were all dying, mm -hmm. with explosives made with imported cotton or imported mm -hmm. fats, mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. copper bands on shells which had come from Britain. I mean, <laughs> it's quite extraordinary. Mm -hmm. What we need to do, I think, and what somebody, and I hope somebody's listening here, what we need to do is to look at the merchant shipping records and see who was carrying what to whom. And there must be something around in records that haven't been, shall we say, um, forgotten about. <laughs> yeah, quite. OK. But the fact the corn, the fact the Cornhill trading with the enemy committees was was all destroyed. That tells you something. In fact, yeah. I owe Andrew Lambert. Uh, sorry, I owe Nicholas Lambert that. Mm. That is a very, very important point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The absence of documents can say something too, can't they? So. But I think that I think there's probably enough stuff there if people are willing to spend the time when when they can, uh, mm -hmm. uh, and to uh, and to look at who was carrying what where, because mm -hmm. I'd love to know how many British ships were carrying stuff to Christiana, Copenhagen, uh, Rotterdam, mm -hmm. etc. Mm -hmm. at the time, and there uh, and there were quite a few. There's a very good. Uh, very good sort of cartoon at the beginning here and th there it is I'll, I'll show it to you and there we have a german officer yeah. right yeah. waving his arms in the air surrounded by bales of cotton cotton for holland cotton for sweden cotton for norway and he's saying who said god punish england god bless england who lets us have the sinews of war and that was in punch in 1915. Yeah. Was it? Okay. how about that Okay, one person who wants to do more research is John Day. He's asking, uh, where should I look on how, German, how Germany financed their war? And he assumes the cost of material from Sweden and so forth increased considerably. Any but it did, it did, although I think what the Germans seem to have done is that they issued bonds. Hmm. They issued bonds which were uh, taken up by various Scandinavian banks. This is all part of their sort of lending policy that eventually ended in tears with the inflation. Mm, mm. But they did issue bonds, and in fact, and in fact, they they had a they had a mechanism by which they could buy this material, uh, and and afford the and afford the inflated prices. Mm -hmm. Okay. But um, I'm no great expert on Ger on German war no, finance. It's an sure. important point, and and more people ought to sort of ought to sort of uh, ought to sort of work on it because. Sure. No, 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 what I find surprising is that this material has not been publicized more. Mm. You know, yeah. as Consett said, you know, there, are, there is an issue here, mm -hmm. a very important issue. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. OK, um, from G. Leslie, so I'm sorry, I don't know your, your, your name properly. Uh, was there not any surprise that Scandinavians suddenly wanted vastly more of everything? <laughs> Um, was it not suspected that these goods were, were not for Scandinavia, but for Germany? Um, had it well, been known, it had been stopped. And, it, and well, it, yeah, it yeah. was more than suspected. 
Yeah. I mean, Consett, our naval attaché, was wandering around ports and he had one or two other people, although the, the number of consuls was actually quite limited. And one thing I didn't mention is there was a meeting of the three Scandinavian governments of the, towards the end of 1914 in Malmo, I think it was, led by the Swedes and the Danes, saying we're not going to publish any more of our export imports mm -hmm. because they didn't want to tell people what was happening. But it was pretty clear what was happening. I mean, there were there were occasions when people were going around docks in in Scandinavia and just seeing cargoes being transported from one ship to another. Mm -hmm. You know, they were coming in from abroad and then they were being they were being put, you know, put into a coaster that would go to Germany, mm -hmm. etc. I mean, it was pretty it was it was pretty obvious, actually, sure. for anybody who wanted to see. If you wanted to see it, yeah. I mean, the follow-on bit of the, the question is, you know, how, how much did Germany control this? I mean, how much were they able to use the Scandinavians just to do their shopping and 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 and, and order amounts and and and, and things like that? Um, well, they they helped. In fact, were a, a large number of German rail of German railway trucks around Scandinavia. It was mm. it was it was mentioned, and um, and they and they cooperated again. This is a very interesting issue. How the German I'm not quite sure. I should know, actually. The street, it wasn't the Reichsbahn in those days. It was the various German federal companies. But certainly it, it is said that there were a very large number of German railway, railway trucks in Scandinavian harbours. Mm -hmm. And the things just, it just got transferred either to, either to, either to railway trains or to other ships, etc. I mean, it was, it was blatant. It was absolutely blatant. And I feel sorry for poor old Consett. He must have gone spare about this. Mm -hmm. Because he would, nobody would listen to him, right? Apparently, well, no, well, they will now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, you're 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 up for a couple more? Yes, I am definitely. Yes. Okay, so Chen Xiaowu, hope I've got that right, uh, is asked one. Uh, I, so didn't the decisions, didn't the fact that the decisions of, of, of releasing captured ships by the Committee of Contraband prove that Britain was acting according to rules? And therefore enhance Britain's reputation in contrast to Germany. Is the question. I'm afraid it didn't, it's, uh, uh, because um, the Americans, in particular, who, who saw themselves as the referees of the Atlantic War, said that the rules say that you that, that 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 you take a ship in and then you put its cargo in front of a court. Mm. What the Americans had against the contraband committee was that the decision seemed to be completely arbitrary. And that annoyed them considerably. Mm, 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 mm. Here's one an interesting one. So Alistair Hart's asking, sounds like the German fleet had very detailed, you know, from what you're saying, very detailed intelligence on vessel cargoes and their destinations and so forth. And so it seems uh, there must have been a very large, perhaps successful spy network related to British ports and shipping agents and so forth. I mean, how much did they, how much did they know? But I think I think actually it was more sort of from the sort of the from the continental side. I mean, the, the Germans knew that certain Danish ships were friends and shouldn't mm -hmm. be attacked. Mm -hmm. uh, the Germans knew that, um, although to a diminishing extent, once the unrestricted campaign started, uh, that in fact, um, you know, the, the, there were certain ships that were actually operating in their interest. I suspect in 1915, as a, as, a, as a colleague once said, you know, that the Germans sank a lot of their own cargoes mm -hmm. in 1915. In the first stage of the of the unrestricted campaign, so I think the German navy did have a certain amount of intelligence. I'm not sure. I don't think you needed that many spies actually. Once the stuff had come to Scandinavia, the whole system worked in your favour because mm -hmm. people wanted to get rich. As always, many people got very rich indeed. May I say this seems to be working quite well, the technology, but it doesn't always work in everyone's favor because it is being pointed out by Professor Hugh Murphy that one of the books over your shoulder may well be one that he sent you for review back in 1998 and never received. Oh, I apologize. Which one's that? <laughs> we'll have to get him to tell us. Pop it in the chat, would you, Hugh? Which book is that? Or type there. Uh... Well, we'll let him. We'll let him. We'll let him answer. We'll come back. Uh, we'll come back to that. He's just trying to the only books I haven't I haven't reviewed yet, as far as I know, 
are for for after the Mariner's Mirror are two books on anti-slavery, which uh, are in the right. room and which I'm going okay. to. Okay, no, I think it's. I think I'm up to date. Otherwise, actually. I'm sure you are. He probably doesn't know what he's talking about. <laughs> no, no, no. Come on, come on. <laughs> okay, an anonymous attendee now. Uh, <clears throat> so this is ominous. Uh, wants to know what British goods were directly exported to Germany, regardless of what the British government wanted. Kunika would like to answer this question live, I'm told. So, Kunika, I'm going to stop in my tracks and hand over to you. Is that how this is going to work? I need to mute you. Is that right? Oh dear. Hang on. Yeah. Uh, fast unmute. Sorry, that was her bad. Right. No, never mind. Um, the technical glitch. Let's start that one again. What British goods were directly exported to Germany, regardless of what the British government wanted? Who were the members of contraband committee? How did they become members? <laughs> Why did they deliberately sabotage what they were supposed to do? Those are some of the basic questions we need to answer. Hmm. Um, it, doesn't it? Tungsten, tungsten was actually exported. Some of the tungsten we sent to Sweden went straight to Germany. Um, I think I'm right in saying that copper was the same. We, um, we also, um, I think some of the, some of the oils and fats were actually, uh, actually transported too. The, the main factor though, was that British imports allowed the Scandinavians to export a massive amount of material of their own to Germany. Mm. That was the factor. Mm. The, 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 in fact, but yes, but certain stuff did. I mean, certainly, certainly copper. Let, let me find a copper page here. Um, the on my tungsten page, nickel. Yeah, we sent to Sweden five hundred and four tons of nickel in nineteen fifteen, of which seventy tons went to Germany directly. Mm. And the rest was used in Sweden to make material for the Germans. Um, so stuff was, there was a certain amount was sent directly, but the major factor was we were able to help the neutrals. The, nor, Denmark could not have provided the amount of food and fats and other things that it did if it hadn't had supplies from us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, here's a question from John Ross that I very much approve of. Uh, did the French take an interest in this trade and the blockade at all? They did, and they tried to force us to, for example, to stop cotton being used. However, when it came to exporting stuff from North Africa to make up for the fertilizer shortage, um, as in fact, uh, Consit says in a rather ironic way, they wanted to keep up with things. <laughs> mm. And Rio Tinto, Rio Tinto use the stuff, the pyrites from their mines to help these people with their fertilizers. Hmm. That probably would have come up in the uh, in the in the Cornhill committee, but of course that's all been forgotten about. I wonder in the Rio, do Rio Tinto have archives? How very interesting, what a thought. No, yeah, no, yeah. might do. Okay, <clears throat> how are we doing? Okay. Uh, let's keep going here. Ta Alex Pickering again. Was the failure of the blockade a signal of the dominance of the Foreign Office in directing Britain's blockade policy? Uh, I think the short answer is yes, for most of the time. But, I, but things begin to change when Lloyd George comes in. We take the war a lot more seriously in 1917 and 1918. Mm -hmm. and, 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 the various, and this again is worthy of further thought, and the various political factors that had mitigated against the blockade being effective began to change. Mm. Uh, and people began to think, well, you know, we're fighting this war seriously, and therefore we have to take a more serious approach. And by 1917, all the figures I mentioned had begun to come, uh, to come down. It wasn't perfect. The Swedes continued to use British coal to export stuff to export iron ore to Germany in 1918. But nonetheless, things changed and got a lot better. And all the graphs in, in, in Consit's book come down in 1917, mm. because we get serious. Mm -hmm. But I think the key here is, as far as the Foreign Office is concerned, the Americans are now not just on side, they're in the war. And to some extent, we're following the Americans who want to, who will take measures that we 
never even thought of taking in 1915 and 1916 against the, against the neutrals. Here's one, Tom Golding, I'm, I'm, I'm digesting. Um, uh, would you say there were points in the war where the German commerce raiding campaigns were more effective against the, uh, against the Anglo-French war effort than the British blockade of Germany was to the central powers? Were there times? <clears throat> I'm not really sure about that. I think, mm. that, I think that in 1915, there were so, so few U-boats at sea but in fact, um, although they tried to use terror, as Kerber points out, by deliberately sinking liners, mm -hmm. uh, very good book this, if you haven't read it, Kerver, K-O-E-R-V-E-R, uh, the, the Kaiser's U-boat campaign against America, that they deliberately were trying to use terror to stop ships, ships, ships being used. It didn't work. Um, then in 1916, control is exerted over them. In 1917, yes, the U-boat U -boat campaign does well, but actually doing well doesn't help the Germans too much because it stops the neutral sailing. Mm. So the Germans lose the trade that the neutrals were carrying. And in fact, one gets the impression that in early 1917, the Americans coming into the war, the unrestricted U-boat campaign, the fact that the, allies, that the allies and associated powers are willing to take a much more robust attitude means that the whole overall context of the war changes and it becomes the serious kind of war we imagined it was from 1914 but it wasn't okay greg kennedy has one for you mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> hello greg nice nice to hear from you uh so this is it so how could britain also a defender of neutrals as the rationale for the country's entry into the war, right? A defender of the rule of law. How could it have invaded neutrals to improve the blockade measures? I mean, how could they have done it? Seems a bit counter to the stated war aims into both domestic morale and international benevolence. No serious analyst thought blockade would be total or effective within any short, shorter time frame. So is this not more that this reality shows the limits of British power and ec economic warfare, the limits of, of British power effectively? So well, we wouldn't, have, we wouldn't have invaded the neutrals. Okay. We would have encouraged the Germans to invade Denmark mm. and possibly Holland. Mm. And also got the Swedes to declare war. In fact, that interesting point, of course, because the early part of the war, just the war starts, that the Russians uh, thinking of attacking the Swedes because they thought the Swedes were about to attack them. Mm. Now, if they'd done that and Sweden had come into the war, I think we would have had a totally different situation. Now, the Germans actually didn't want to invade Denmark because they, they, they or Holland, because they didn't think they had enough forces. Um, so um, I don't think we actually planned to invade any country. What we wanted was for these countries to come into the war so we could take some action against them. Mm. But... Uh, Concert is very in interesting. He says that all these bloody neutrals, effectively, they were helping the Germans, and we'd gone to war to help a neutral country. Mm -hmm. So the sort of ideology on the British side was that, look, we'd gone to war to help neutrals, and now the neutrals are trying to undermine us. Mm. Okay, okay, good. Um, they keep coming, they keep coming, Eric. <clears throat> okay, all right, fine, fine, fine. All right. I'm glad I've been provocative. You have been provocative, and I knew there'd be a lot of questions, um, and, you've, and you've left some time for it, so you've, you've asked for it, I suppose. Was any Dominion trade... This is fun, this is fun. <laughs> isn't it? Alex Pickering, uh, again. Was any Dominion trade going to Scandinavia uh, or, or Germany? So, uh, uh, for example, how, how much control did Britain have over, over the empire's uh, trade? Yeah. My impression is the same as the amount of British stuff. I mean, the British Empire provided materials for the neutrals that went to Germany. Um, and what is it? It was the it was the uh, was it the copra? I'm not sure. But but the the various materials that were provided to the to, to, uh, to the neutrals, many of them came came from the empire. And I'm not sure if they came came necessarily in Canadian ships or whatever. But yes, I mean, I mean, the the the. At that time, Britain controlled this kind of policy. Uh, I'm not sure if the Dominion governments had much thought about this. Uh, but yes, I mean, this it's is all part of this general attempt of the British Empire to uh, continue with normal economic relations, even with an enemy you're supposed to be in a total war with. Mm 
Can I put you at ease a little bit? Um, Hugh Murphy, was he's only joking. There was no book. There is no book over your shoulder that he's waiting for since now. Uh, typical Hugh. Yeah, and you did. he did get you because you did look aghast, I must say. You did look uh, horrified by the very idea. Uh, so, fear not. Uh, Neil Datsun again. Surely Gray's great anxiety was not to antagonize the USA, and it could possibly be argued that the British war effort could have been broken very swiftly by US antagonism. Probably the danger appeared much more likely to him than it does in retrospect. Additionally, the Russians were terrified of Sweden joining the war on the German side. Another. That's all true, and I do not disagree with it. But on the other hand, there is the alternative argument that in fact the Americans were becoming so committed to the Allied war effort that in fact there was no way that they would actually be provoked. But as I said in my talk, I'm not so sure about that. Mm -hmm. I think there was a strong anti-British feeling in the United States, Navy second to none in 1916. Um, the, you know, as I say, the, 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 the Federal Reserve's advice and this kind of thing. I think ang 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 Anglo-American relations were in a pretty bad state. And so one can see, in fact, and, and I can see why Gray would console himself with the argument that he, he stopped a major conflict between ourselves and the Americans. It's a matter of judgment. I mean, I don't have a, a strong feeling one side or the other. Um, but, I think, but I think the Americans were the key, actually. I mean, at least you can say that objectively. The Americans were the key. Once, after the Americans stopped being the great defenders of the neutrals, the whole position of the neutrals declined. The political economic position of the neutrals, strategic position of the neutrals declined. Uh, and the Americans began to push for blockade to a degree that we never even imagined. <laughs> Okay. Um, well, what about Andy Field's question then? So that, uh, you know, being, being generous is a part of the issue that the British were not fully familiar with total war. They just didn't know. I think, I, I think Andy's right, actually. Yes. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that there was not uh, until, certainly until the Lord George government. I mean, I, I don't think there was the political, uh, you know, what's the right word? The, the sort of political context that actually thought of fighting a total war. That in fact, you know, we continue to trade. It was important mm -hmm. that we continue to trade. Mm -hmm. uh, and if the Germans gain from this, well, so what? <laughs> okay. okay. We, well, back to the Germans then, because the G. Leslie, sorry, I, I, I again, I, I don't know your name, is following up a, qu a question from, from from earlier, wants to know what the markup. What, what was the markup on goods from Scandinavians to to Germany? You know, did, did oh, I, I, I should have noted it. And about did Germany, uh, about. Sorry. About a hundred, about two hundred percent. Okay, something like that. Yeah. Okay. And did Germany indicate, you know, how much of X Y did they send in orders? They say we want so much copper, so much, so much uh, cotton, and 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 which was sort of asked earlier. And 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 which of the Scandinavian countries was, was most greedy regarding prices? And which of them sort of um, well, well, the Norwegians were because they couldn't be because we pressurized them. Um, one gets the impression that the Danes were willing to screw the Germans as hard as they could. Huh? As we've heard, because of Schleswig-Holstein, they, they had no liking for the Germans. Yeah. They were trying to make as much as they possibly could out of them. Mm -hmm. okay. But the markups were very significant, were very significant. Okay. For example, I mean, the point, uh, well, I mentioned the buying the fish. We could have bought the fish for about, was it 45 pounds a ton or something? And by the time we... It was about 150. So we're talking, we're talking about 200 percent. All right. Well, that damages the war effort to some extent. Well, it was no, it was a it was a markup, but but the Germans mm. were willing to pay. Yeah, of course, yeah, yeah. And of course, this of course raises very interesting questions about the whole running of the German war economy, about you know the black market, mm. which was very important in Germany, but not in Britain. That in fact the um the, the, the complete disorganization of the, of the of the German food food distribution system, mm -hmm. where the people in well, where the peasants in the countryside in Bavaria ate well, and the people in the in the towns didn't. Mm -hmm. So, so the German the Germans had various weaknesses, but I think the point is this that, and I think I would I, I would support this and sustain it at the moment until I see some see, see something that changes my mind. But in fact, if this great cascade of material from the neutrals had stopped. I think 
the the blockade would have would have been much much more effective. Mm -hmm. And I've I've seen a very interesting thing about the Danish East Africa company lost lost two ships. So that's that's all right. Well, that's not not what my sources said, but uh, it wasn't said at the time. But perhaps you know modern no, exactly. modern historians. So it's wrong. But of course, the, but the numbers were quite small, and and the Danes. The Danes, in a sense, to be fair to them, were in a very difficult position. They were caught between a rock and a hard place, really. Mm. And if you can make huge amounts of money by selling stuff to the Germans, and if the, the British will provide you with the material to do it, why not? Mm. It's not your war, is it? Well, no. OK, OK, <laughs> OK. Um, David Richardson wants to know how Farringdon's book was received when it was published in 1923. To be frank, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. I shall look it up. Okay, good. That'd and of course, good. he had a locomotive named after him, A4 Pacific, 60034. <laughs> he, was a, he was a shareholder in the LNER, or at least his son was or something. Okay, anonymous attendee <clears throat> uh, says that you weren't uh, very clear about who the members of the contraband committee were, how they became members, and their motivations for sabotaging what they were there and supposed to do. I'm not, and I would like to know more. And if you'd like to do some research, please do. Perfect, okay, very good. Uh, Alistair Hart, thank you for a fascinating presentation. Uh, and I think he's striking the right kind of tone because we should probably uh, think about uh, releasing you back to your, um, to your, your life. Uh, okay, well done. I'm enjoying it. This has been one of the most enjoyable evenings I've had for a very long time. Uh, excellent, excellent. And I'm, I'm sure the almost 90 uh, people in attendance uh, feel the same way. George Wilton. Um, Jerome Brown says so too. Jo George Wilton, I understand the blockade remained in place through to the Treaty of Versailles in 1919. Yes. Okay. Was it relaxed after the 1918 armistice? Only a little bit. Mm -hmm. And that is very interesting. Very interesting point. Mm -hmm. The blockade was more serious and severe <laughs> after the peace than it had been until the beginning of 1917. Which strikes me as a bit weird. Mm -hmm. You know, the, 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 we get serious about the blockade. And I'm not against that. I mean, it's a perfectly, perfect, you know, understandable way of of utilizing sea power, but I, but I think it's a bit strange that we blockaded the Germans more heavily after the end of the war than we'd done for most of the war. Mm. <laughs> Discuss. <laughs> yeah, quite. Okay. Uh, Peter Bottomley, uh, Winston uh, was very exercised by iron ore movements from Sweden to Germany in 1939-40. Um, interesting that he missed this and other similar trade as First Lord in 1914-15. And that's an that, that's an extremely good point. Mm -hmm. And what I'd like to know is how much Swedish iron ore came down the railway line mm. from Kiruna, mm. changing to a steam locomotive at the border, mm. British coal, <laughs> uh, down to down to Narvik and coming. And I haven't seen figures on that, but it must have been because the weather hasn't changed. And if and if um, Lulea had actually iced up, which I think it probably would have done, uh, I'd like to know how much stuff came through Norway because, mm. but I haven't seen that in any source and it's something that needs to have perhaps, you know, a bit of investigation. Um, but, but certainly, I mean, I think Winston was very, very conscious of the fact that the Swedish supplies of iron ore had actually been, been very important for the German industry mm -hmm. and we hadn't been able to stop them. We even, we weren't able to stop the, even using British coal to transport the stuff across the Baltic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm not sure. People... No, I'm just I'm 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 concentrating on different things, and I'm noticing that some people are, are tapping their their thanks and their goodbyes in the in the in chat. It seems to be popping up, and 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 I think that's that's something that we can, uh, you know, encourage or allow uh, as we continue to use questions through the Q Q and A. Ian Stafford, I think we're at um, again. We were allowing uh, then British flagged ships. Uh, which is the whole empire at this, at this date, to sail on. Were, were we allowing British flagships, in other words, from the whole empire, to sail on? Or were the committee allowing only the neutrals 
uh, to sail on? Were we stopping ships leaving UK ports, for example? We uh, were stopping neutrals, but British ships continued to sail, as far as I can make out. Okay. And this yeah. is where the research need, you know, needs yeah. to be done. What yeah. British ships took what to where yeah. in yeah. Scandinavia in, in 1914 to 1917? Okay, okay, good. Neil Datsun. <clears throat> Gray cites an instance when a known blockade, blockade runner was stopped by the French Navy rather than the Royal Navy as a, as a policy decision taken at the highest level so as not to antagonize US opinion. Uh, he claims the subterfuge was successful and US opinion thus mollified. Well, he would say that, wouldn't he? Because, uh, because he was, I mean, he made a very great, great principle of this policy that we mustn't alienate the Americans. Mm. And one can see the reasons for that. One can see the reasons for not alienating the Swedes because of connections with Russia um, and so on. Um, but it doesn't seem to me that we're being desperately serious in our attitude. Now, the, the big question here is, and it's a matter of judgment, and I haven't really got a great answer to it, is were the Americans as potentially hostile as we suspected, Gray, for example, suspected they, they, they might be? Mm -hmm. And I think that's an important point. I think the, the, the sources like Consit, et cetera, who say the Americans were totally committed against the Germans may be a little bit, I'm not sure it's op op optimistic or pessimistic. Um, I think that keeping the Americans on side was very, very important. But the basic point is this, that without the Americans on side, the blockade wouldn't work. OK, earlier I asked you a question from David Richardson about Farrington's book in 1923. And of course, it was Constance's book. And I should I, he's apologizing. I should apologize. That just shows me to have been an automaton. But I think it was answered uh, uh, appropriately. So we'll just move on from, from, from that. Uh, spare our brushes. Consett's book should be read by everyone. Everybody. No, it is brilliant. OK, let's say that. Dave Potter, regarding your comments on the German motivation to engage the Grand Fleet at Jutland not being connected to pressure from the blockade, what do you think the true motivation was? Scheer was very annoyed that they had not introduced unrestricted submarine warfare. Mm. He'd been a strong supporter of it. But when the German leadership for once exerted control over the Navy and said, no, you mustn't do it, he decided he would then integrate the U-boats of the rest of the high sea fleet and try to come across uh, and try to produce some kind of alternative strategy of wearing the British down. And what happened at Jutland was the first was the first sort of iteration of that. And he sort of continues tr tr trying to do it over the summer with the August sortie and this kind of thing. In a way, she is sulking because the German government will not introduce unrestricted submarine warfare. Sheer support for unrestricted submarine warfare is not a result of the Battle of Jutland, it's what he already thinks. And what he doesn't, what he's trying to show perhaps is that fleet actions are not that productive. But he does his best in the circumstances. And I, I, I said to a colleague yesterday in a, in a phone call, you know, that perhaps when he's chasing the British northwards, he's thinking, oh, to hell with this, you know, sort of, you know, they won't allow unrestricted submarine warfare, so we'll take some risks. Mm. Um, but only then, uh, uh, but only when his U-boats are withdrawn for a restricted campaign, which he didn't really believe in, does he actually stop taking sorties out to sea. But that's very much a sort of, lesser alternative he wants unrestricted warfare but the german government for once will not allow him to have it but then of course the situation changes in late 1916 and of course you get unrestricted submarine warfare and she is happy but a lot of people aren't especially the americans <laughs> very good okay there are two remaining questions so maybe i'll just request that it stays at that and then we'll we'll we'll, we'll run through those and then um say our goodbyes um, so this is uh, G. Leslie again. Um, did none of the anti-German British exporters think to send uh, Duff components or Duff goods to mess up some German manufacturers so as to make money, but also cause some problems? I get the impression it's largely raw materials. Yeah, okay. It's not manufactured products. Mm. I think it's I think it's raw materials. It's fodder. It's uh, it's right. coal. Um, and so on. It's 
it's sort of um, fishing fishing nets mm -hmm. um, and so on. I mean, it's basically raw materials to help the Scandinavians, Scandinavian economy continues so that they can, well, just to, in theory to help it continue, but actually in practice to help them supply the, you know, supply the Germans. Okay, Alex Pickering, uh, I presume the blockade was tightened to promote British naval strength and ensure Germany uh, did not, uh, there's a typo there, did not renege during the peace negotiations and perhaps prevent enemy business gaining advantage too soon. Um, I'm not reading this well. Alex, you Well, I think, I think, I think there is a, something to be investigated, I think, still about sort of the way the blockade was continued after after okay. the armistice. Okay. I mean, the it was to keep pressure on the Germans. I mean, after all, one of the main factors in the defeat of Germany had been the break in domestic morale. And if you could continue pressure on the Germans to keep them depressed and to make them sort of malleable and to stop them thinking in terms of restarting the war, that was all in your favour. Mm -hmm. But I do find it strange that the blockade was much more effective after 1918 than it had been in 1916. <laughs> mm -hmm. No, I mean, you're, you're, this, is a, this, is a, this is clearly a very important um, subject. And, uh, but it, I want more people to research. This is a huge area for research, I think. Yeah, right. Okay. Well, all right. Thank you. We, know, we know what to do next then. Um, Eric, thank you so much. Uh, pleasure, absolute pleasure. Uh, it, was, it was as, as excellent as I expected it would be. That's very kind, thank you. As, as did all of the many, many, perhaps even record setting uh, attendees uh, thought, um, I'm, I'm very sure. So it's with the usual uh, thanks that we, we, will, we will say our goodbye. Cheers to us, that's right. See you again. Right, that's all right. the best. Bye See everyone. you soon, see you soon, see you soon. Bye then, bye then, bye bye.